Well, we start a brand new sermon series. It's actually a teaching uh, series um, on, uh, on money, all right? Uh, and I know uh, some of you guys are going, oh my goodness, you know, is, was this the right Sunday to come? Yes, it was. Uh, for some, okay, it's not a strange reason. I know why. Uh, but when we talk about money in the church, it's almost like you're talking about the boogeyman. Like it's this weird, like, I feel uncomfortable. What's he going to say? Is he going to ask for my money? Uh, is it all about money? The church is always asking for money. And, uh, but, but here's the thing. God talks about money. The Bible talks about money. And so as the people of God, as the church, then we should talk about money. We should not be afraid to talk about money. Like, is there, is there pain and hurt? And have we experienced some really, really bad things regarding money and the church? Absolutely. But that doesn't mean that, that we don't talk about it. But rather, we come to the Word of God asking, how then are we to view money in the right way, in the way that God intended? And so over these next four weeks, we're literally going to unpack some key things that I think we should know as a church, as the people of God, that's going to set us up to really, really experience the, the, the freedom, the freedom to not just talk about money, but then to be able to handle it. And so this sermon uh, series is called Handle Money Like a Grown-Up, all right? I want all of us to come out on the other side uh, with the tools that we need to handle money like a grown-up. Now, a couple of weeks ago in the book of Hebrews, we spoke about the difference between, between uh, being a toddler and being an adult. If you were here, you'd remember that, uh, that we are to train up our senses uh, so that we might be able to distinguish uh, between good and evil. And I believe that that includes money, right? That we live in a physical world and also a spiritual one. And money has the ability to impact us both in the physical and in the spiritual and so we need to be able to handle money like grown-ups, like those who are spiritually mature, like those who are continually growing in the gospel. Now, I could have come and given you tons of stats on money, on how uh, South Africa handles money, uh, how, how we understand debt and investments and all of that stuff. I could have given you stats after stats after stats, but I've decided not to do that uh, because most of us know about these stats. We may not know them in detail, but they impact us. Like when the petrol price goes up and when it comes down by a little bit. Like all of that impacts us. And, and so we, we, how do we handle our money in those situations? So instead of giving you uh, all these consumer index stats things that I spend so much time reading, I'm just going to tell you stories. All right? I just want to give you a, a couple stories. And those stories are personal because they're about me and my wife, or my wife and I, to be grammatically correct. Yep. And my hope is that as you hear these, you would not hear, oh, that's the, the perfect way to do it. No. Imperfect human beings. But we're in pursuit of a perfect savior, of one who has given us all that we need to be able to live in a way that honors and pleases him. And so let me, uh, by way of intro, uh, tell you about how we used to understand money. Now, I uh, grew up in a, a relatively privileged household. Um, I'm honest enough to say that. Uh, relatively privileged. Two parents, a mom and a dad, and uh, they both did relatively well. Uh, so we went to some pretty good schools. Uh, we lived in some really good neighborhoods. Um, and so for me, money was this thing that I know it exists and I know my, my parents make it and they use it to provide for us, but I never really worried about it because uh, whatever I needed, I would get, uh, unless it was like really out there and my dad was like, there's no way that's going to happen. But most of the time, if I needed a new pair of shoes or uh, I wanted a, a bicycle, uh, there was means to acquire it. And so I grew up going, you know, money is it's there, but I, I'm not really too concerned about it. Then at the age of 13, and some of you are familiar with my story, at the age of 13, my father passed away. And that changed the dynamics of money in our household. Things became really tight for a season. And I began to realize that, man, if you don't have money, times get hard very quickly. They became very hard for us. And being the oldest, I thought, you know what, let, let, me, let me assist the family by, by trying as best as I can to remove myself from, from the, the things that, 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 that need money 
where, where my mom needed to provide. I said, you know what, I actually don't need this. I don't need that. Don't worry too much about that, you know, because, because let's rather pour the money uh, where it's needed. I will be okay. See, what it did in me is that it, it grew this, this, this worry, this anxiety with regards to money. Later in my life, I was afraid to, to even look at money. I was that guy that when I went shopping and I swiped there at the ATM, and if it went through, it was like, wow, this is a miracle, because I had no idea how much was in my bank account. Literally, I would never look at my bank account, just because I was, I was just worried, I was, I, was, I, was, I was anxious. That's how I looked at money. My, my wife, on the other end, um, she, she grew up uh, completely different to how I grew up, things weren't always there, and um, it, it was a hustle. It was real. But, but because she, uh, and this is the Lord's blessing over her life, was a woman who was always like, you know what, I, I, because we have so little of it, when we do have it, I need to make sure that I account for it, that I use it wisely. I don't want to be like everyone else that just squanders it. No, 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 no. We, we, we need to make sure that, that, that the money that we have should go to the right things. But you see, over time, what happened is, she became very controlling over money. She, she was that person that literally every day in our early marriage, she would jump on to the bank account and check how much is there, and she'd have Excel spreadsheet after Excel spreadsheet after Excel spreadsheet of what uh, this should pay for and that should pay for. And, and I get it. Like Some of you are like, no, no, what's wrong with that? That sounds like a wise woman. <laughs> but like when you're checking it every 10 minutes, it's like, hey, the money's not, like, it's not going in. Nothing's going to change in 10 minutes. But she needed to know, she needed, she needed to have that control because she's like, you know what, I know what it's like to have none. And so I need to be in control. Now you put those two people together. Uh, let's, let's just say, you know, it, uh, things don't always end well. It would cause fights in our marriage, frustrations. And, and it was that whole thing of like, she would say to me like, hey, we need, to, we need to talk about money. We need to talk about budgeting or about the next season of our lives. And I'd go, yeah, yeah, yeah we'll, we'll, yeah, we'll definitely talk about that. Um, just not now. She'd have to set appointments with me just so that we can talk about money. And then the whole time, like the, the, the intensity in which she brought to those conversations was, was but you're amazing and you're not scary. And I, just want, I just want people to know that. But, but it was scary. I think most of us tend to fall in either one of those camps. And, and here's the thing, like, we, for, for many of us, and, and, and it's weird because I was saying to my wife, I was like, no one ever taught me how to budget and how to do all these things and savings and, and all this stuff. Like, I, I listed a bunch of stuff here, budgeting, investing, saving, stocks, compound interest, capital gains interest. Like, I was like, no one, no one taught me about this stuff. And she's like, well, Honor, you took accounting in first year. And I was like, yeah, if you knew me in first year, then you would know that... <laughs> You know, and that's a whole other conversation for another day. But, 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 but for most of us, like, like, no one taught us this stuff. Like, we had to figure it out. It's like you graduate, and then they're like, here's your salary, and a couple of credit cards, good luck. And no wonder we find ourselves in the situations that we're in. And, and so my hope over these next couple of weeks is to give some knowledge around that kind of stuff, to, to bring people who, who, who are experts at that kind of stuff, to equip us so that we might handle money like grown-ups, so that we would not be ignorant and, 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 and neglect and just kind of go, you know what, I'm, I'm not, it, I know it exists, but I just don't want to deal with it, like, like an ostrich with its head in the sand, which for interest's sake... Um, is, is how we use it is actually horrible. Like, it's got, nothing, it's got nothing to do with that. Like an ostrich, because we think it's like, yeah, yeah, when predators are coming, the ostrich puts its head in the sand cause, so that it doesn't have to deal with the predators. And actually, this is for free, all right? This is not part of the sermon. But, like, you know that that's wrong. Like, the reason an ostrich puts its head in the ground, it's because it can't uh, lay nests in the, the trees, and so it, it puts its eggs in the ground, and then it puts its head down there and turns the eggs around so that they stay warm. Do you guys know that? Okay, there, your question of the day. There's something you've learned. Um, but but, but what, we should not neglect. We should not just be like, you know, it's there, whatever. But also, we should not control. Because when we want to control, it reveals something else. Here's my prayer 
for us over these next few weeks is that we would find freedom in our finances because we have freedom from our finances. All right, so, 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 so my prayer every week is going to be that we, we would have freedom in our finances because we have found freedom from our finances. And so in and through and beyond this series, my desire for you is that you would experience the abundant life. We've been talking about it the whole year, but my, my, my hope is that you would experience the abundant life, that you would live in the more, remember we started the year, hashtag more, that you would live in the more that God has for you. And included in that more is finances. In this teaching series, I, I, I want us to get super practical, and we will. We will. We're going to get like super, so we're going to talk about compound interest and what the Bible, you know the Bible, the Bible talks about, about investments and savings. It's going to blow your mind. We're going to talk about it all. But like with everything else, if we want to do right, we must think right. Now, here's another way to say it. Right thoughts about God lead to right responses to God. Right thoughts about God lead to right responses to God. And, and so I would like to start our sermon series with some doctrine. I'd like to start with some doctrine. And this is what we will anchor everything that we talk about over these next few weeks in. That if you want any success in finances, then you must have these two things that we're going to talk about in place. If, if you want any success in your finances, we, we, you're going to have to anchor yourself in these two things. They must become your north compass. Number one, God owns everything. Yeah. Amen. Like I know, I know some of you are sitting here going, oh God, that, I mean, on it, it's, it's obvious, right? Like it's not so obvious. Yeah. Your bank statements reveal that it's not so obvious. God owns everything. Yeah. If he created everything, then he must own everything. Yeah. Psalm 24, verse 1 says this, the, the earth and everything in it, the world and its inhabitants, belong to the Lord. Yeah. I like how the New Living Translation puts it. It says, the earth is the Lord's. And everything in it, the world and all its people belong to him. Friends, this, this is known as the cosmic ownership principle. The cosmic ownership principle. God says that the earth is mine. And everything that fills it is mine. There is nothing in this world and beyond this world, that God does not cry, mine. Yes. This includes, hear me, because I know who I'm speaking to. I, I, I say this regularly here at Rooted Fellowship. Some of the most highly competent, highly educated people. You guys are amazing. The things that you're doing now, incredible. And the things that you will go on to do, even more. And, and, and so, you're welcome. <laughs> Telling you about marriage. Our marriage is great. Uh, you don't like, have to wait seven years. <laughs> I'm joking. That's the last time. That's the last time I'm going to bring it up. Man, I am in trouble now. I'm in trouble. Send that uh, complaint to uh, Jono at Rooted Fellowship. <sighs> everything, everything, everything. God looks at it, he says, it's mine. This includes every innovative concept, every groundbreaking system, every trailblazing model, every pioneering idea, anything that, that leads to a world-class anything, God says, mine. And so put away your cute patents and trademarks. That's what God says. Just like when you come before me, put, put that away. Because many of us, I created it. It's my idea. I trademarked it. He's, he, like God goes, what? 
Who gave you the idea to do that? Who gave you the ability to study that? Who gave you the power to do it? Like, it's all mine. Friends, if we, if we were to, to, to turn each and every one of us inside out, you know what I would say? Made in the image of God. Made in the image of God. Th- that is why God can say, all of it is mine. All of it, all of it is mine. It all belongs to him. And included in everything is your money. Which already should tell us that the word your is misplaced. But we'll get to that. Why does he he own everything? I've alluded to it, but let's go back to Psalm 24. Verse 2, it tells us he he owns everything because he made everything. He spoke it into existence. Now, I don't know. Like, there's some super creative people here. But but I don't know. I don't know if you're able to speak things into existence. And I know some of y'all are going to get super cute and go, you know, but I wrote an amazing song. (laughs) Stay with me. Psalm Psalm 24, verse 2 says, For he laid the earth's foundation on the seas and built it on the ocean depths. He created it all. Even the places that we have not yet discovered. God goes, it's mine. It's mine. God owns everything. And let me say it again, even the money you have. The money that's sitting in your bank account right now, it's his. The money that's sitting in your investment account, come on someone, it's his. Even in your tax-free investment. And some of you are going, tax-free what? I didn't even, I, I didn't even know there was. We're going to get to that in a couple weeks. But even that money there, it's his. All of it is his. So now, if we don't own it, how then do we relate to the money and the resources that we do have? Well, I'm glad you asked. The answer is found in what we call the stewardship principle. So there's the, the cosmic ownership principle. That belongs to God. And, and then there's what they call the, the stewardship principle. Well, now we enter the room. Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 17 to 18 says this. You may say to yourself, my power and my own ability have gained this wealth for me. But remember that the Lord your God gives you the power to gain wealth in order to confirm his covenant he swore to your ancestors as it is today. Let let me read that to you in the message. Uh, We don't preach from the message, but I love how it reads. Same two verses. If you start thinking to yourselves, which we often do, I did all this. And all by myself. I'm rich. It's all mine. Well, think again. (laughs) Remember that God, your God, gave you the strength to produce all this wealth so as to confirm the covenant that he promised to your ancestors as it is today. Now, Now, because I don't want to practice a smash and grab approach to studying God's word. Let, let's, let, let's read a few more verses to give these two verses a little bit more context. And so let's read verses 1 to 20 of Deuteronomy chapter 8. M- Moses is, is warning the, the people of God, saying, hey guys, when, when, when we get to the promised land, when things become really, really good, be careful, be careful, He says, verse 1, carefully follow every command I'm giving you today so that you may live and increase. I want to live and increase. My hope is that you want to live and increase. And may enter and take possession of the land the Lord swore to your ancestors. Remember that the Lord your God led you on the entire journey these 40 years in the wilderness so that he might humble you and test you to know what was in your heart, whether or not you would keep his commands. He humbled you by letting you go hungry. 
Is anyone hungry? <laughs> then he gave you manna to eat, which you and your ancestors had not known, so that you might learn that man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. Your clothing did not wear out. And your feet did not swell those 40 years. Keep in mind that the Lord your God has been disciplining you just as a man disciplines his son. That's a whole parenting course that one day we need to get into. So keep the commands of the Lord your God by walking in his ways and fearing him. For the Lord your God is bringing you into a good land. A land with streams, springs, and deep Water sources flowing in both valleys and hills. A land of wheat, barley, vines, figs, and pomegranates. A land of olive oil and honey. Like, I, I, I read that and I go, Lord, is this Africa? Is this, is this? <laughs> a land where you will eat food without shortage. Where you will lack nothing. A land whose rocks are iron and from whom, whose hills you, you will mine copper. When you eat and are full, you will will bless the Lord your God for the good land he has given you. Be careful that you don't forget the Lord your God by feigning to keep his commandments, ordinances, and statutes that I am giving you today. Be careful as you, as they say, stack bread, as you make money, investment after invest. Be careful as you buy your home or your second home, as you buy the car of your dreams, be careful as you add to your honors, your masters, your PhD. Be careful when you eat and are full and build beautiful homes to live in and your herds and flocks grow large and your silver and gold multiply and everything else you have increases. I love, like, can you believe this? Like, I know that there's, there's theology out there that's like, you know what, as the people of God, we must, you know, it's just always just tough, you know, but God just wants us to just always, uh, like, just, just, just enough, it's always just enough. Just, just. Like, th- that's not what I read here. And yet, if you think these next few weeks are going to be a gospel prosperity of some sorts, then you need to keep coming back. (laughs) Be careful that your heart doesn't become proud and you forget the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the place of slavery. He led you through the great and terrible wilderness with its poisonous snakes and scorpions, a thirsty land where there was no water, He brought water out of the flint rock for you. He fed you in the wilderness with manna, which your ancestors had not known, in order to humble and test you, so that in the end he might cause you to? To? You may say to yourself, my power and my own ability have gained this wealth for me. But remember that the Lord your God gives you the power to gain wealth in order to confirm his covenant he swore to your ancestors as it is today. If you ever... Forget the Lord your God and follow other gods to serve them and bow in worship to them. I testify against you today that you will certainly perish. Like the nations the Lord is about to destroy before you, you will perish if you do not obey the Lord your God. I I sometimes wonder. I sometimes wonder the... The, 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 the suffering and the, and the, the pain and, and, and just like all that we are experiencing, I, I, I wonder, in my prayers, I go, Lord, is it because we as the church have strayed from your word? That's not always the case. I know that. But I wonder. Because what it does is I begin to self-evaluate. Lord, where am I in light of following you, in trusting in you? And so Moses warns them pointing out to them the posture of a flourishing condition. Let them always remember their benefactor. In everything, we must give thanks. In everything. Moses warns them against the temptations of a flourishing condition. When we start to make a a little money, 
or we find ourselves doing not too bad, we often fall too quickly to the temptation of pride and forgetfulness. That's what happens. And in our forgetfulness, we become anxious and troubled about many things. That's, that's what happens. When you take your eyes off God, all of a sudden, like, like this, you're worried about money. You're, you're worried, am I going to make it today? Am I going to make it tomorrow? Do I have enough? Have you for, you've forgotten? You must have because you, you, yeah. you didn't have enough before. And he came through. Moses repeats the warning he had often given of the fatal consequences of disregarding God. The road of sin always leads to destruction. The road of sin always, always, always leads to destruction. The point is this. Remember that all that you have comes from God. It is given to us by his gracious, generous, loving hand. Every good thing comes from him. And so don't forget that. But you see, our problem is that when we start to gain, we quickly forget. When we start to gain, we quickly forget. And we're really, really clever about it. Like we'll say all these good things, you know, like, oh, but you know, I need to do this because I'm, I want to be responsible. No, you don't. That's greed talking. Because you've forgotten the goodness of God. He owns it all. And so we are called to relate to all that we have, not as owners, but as stewards, as caregivers. Because all that we have has been given to us by God. God gives us the power and the ability to make money. Yeah. And so God's expectation is that we take care of the stuff that he gives us. That's the expectation, that, that we take care of the stuff that he has given us. If God owns everything, including money, this means regarding your money, or money, because we've taken out your out of that sentence. And so regarding money, we are just his money handlers. We are just his money handlers. Matthew 25, verse 14 to 30. This is the parable of the talents. Some of you know it, but let me read it to us. From verse 14, it says, Again, the kingdom of heaven can be illustrated by the story of a man going on a long trip. He called together his servants and entrusted his money to them while he was gone. He gave five bags of silver to one, two bags of silver to another, and one bag of silver to the lost, dividing it in the proportion to their abilities. I, I wish we had time for this one. Dividing it in proportion to their abilities. We, so, like, we sit here and we go, well, why does they have, and why, why does she have more than, and why does he have, it's not fair. You don't want to stand before a holy God and ask for fairness. Like, if you understand the gospel, you, you don't. And yet we find ourselves doing this. And instead of getting to work with what God has given you, we're out here going, Instagram, how come they have, and why, and why? For some of us, five bags is too much. And for others, one bag is too little. This is why it's important that you understand who you are in relation to your relationship with God. He then left on his trip. Verse 16. The servant who received the five bags of silver began to invest the money and earned five more. The servant with two bags of silver also went to work and earned two. Two more. So, so right here we see, we see that there is investment and then there's also working. But we'll get to that in the weeks to come. But the servant who received the one bag of silver dug a hole in the ground and hid the master's money. 
After a long time, their master returned from his trip and called them to give an account of which all of us are going to have to give one day. Of how they had used his money. The servant to whom he had entrusted the five bags of silver came forward with five more and said, Master, you gave me five bags of silver to invest and I have earned five more. The master was full of praise. Well done, my good and faithful servant. You have been faithful in handling. Remember, we're just money handlers. This small amount, so now I will give you more responsibilities. Let's celebrate together. The servant who had received the two bags of silver came forward and said, Master, you gave me two bags of silver to invest and I have earned two more. The master said, well done, my good and faithful servant. You have been faithful in handling this small amount. So now I will give you many more responsibilities. Let's celebrate together. Verse 24, then the servant with the one bag of silver came and said, master, I knew you were a harsh man. Harvesting crops you didn't plant and gathering crops you didn't cultivate. You know what that tells us? This... (laughs) This tells us that, 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 that this servant had, had the wrong understanding of the master. And so because he had the wrong understanding of the master, it led to the wrong expectations for the master. This is why I say right thoughts about God lead to right responses to God. So, so many of us, we have, the, we have a wrong understanding about the master. We have a wrong understanding about who God is. And so what do we do? We begin to create false narratives. Oh, this is how he is. This, is. this is what he does. We create false narratives because we have an imaginary master. It's, it's a, a God. We create a God of our own imagination instead of God, a God of revelation. This is why it's important. Like, it's important for us to, to be in the word of God seeking to understand who God is. Otherwise, you're going to do stuff, and then God's going to go, what are you doing? Oh, but I, you know, God, you, you, you are this way. I, I am? God, you, you, you're so harsh here in this area. Really? Verse 25, I was afraid I would lose your money, so I hid it in the earth. Look, here is your money back. But the master replied, you wicked and lazy servant. If you knew I harvested crops, I didn't plant and gathered crops, I didn't cultivate. Why didn't you deposit my money in the bank? At least I could have gotten some interest on it. See, the third servant allowed fear and misunderstanding of the master to lead him to be an unfaithful, unwise, and unproductive servant. And this is really sad. Because this is the reality for many of us. And so what is it that perhaps has the potential for you, for you to be unfaithful, unwise, and unproductive? Are you paralyzed by fear? Do you have a misunderstanding of God and what he's calling you to? Are you driven by selfish motives? Are you distracted by the things of this world? Or are you just lazy? Verse 28, then he ordered, take the money from the servant and give it to the one with the 10 bags of silver. To those who use well what they are given, even more will be given. And they will have an abundance. But from those who do nothing, even what little they have will be taken away. I I love the fact here that he's going, hey, it's, it's not that you made mistakes. That's, no, because we make mistakes. We, we serve a God who knows that we make mistakes. But it's in pursuit of being faithful to him. We're not going to be perfect this side of heaven. There is enough grace to cover your mistakes. It's because he did nothing. He, he did absolutely nothing. Nothing. Now throw this useless servant into outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Why was the master angry with this lost servant? Because there was an expectation to steward his things 
well. There is an expectation on us to steward what God has given us and to do so well. There, there is an expectation. God owns everything, including money. We are just his money handlers. We've, we've, got to, we, we've got to nail that into our minds. We've got to anchor ourselves into that if we are to go anywhere in the series. And so, number one is this. God owns everything, and so therefore you and I are just his money handlers. I cannot stress that enough. I cannot stress that enough. That's number one. Number two is your heart always goes where you put God's money. Your heart always goes where you put God's money. Remember, we've already established that it belongs to him. So, so your heart's going to go wherever you put it. Jesus says in Matthew 6, verse 21, For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. To put it plainly, our spending and investing reflects our heart and priorities. Jesus looks at your financial statements, and from that he can tell what you love the most. And if you think you can't see your financial statements, we have bigger problems than you think. <laughs> he just takes a look and he can tell. He can tell what you prioritize, what you value the most, what you think is important. Let me give you a, a quick illustration. So, suppose I start a company. I start a restaurant, right? It's called Smoked Ribs Are Delicious. Okay? That's the name of the restaurant. Smoked Ribs Are Delicious. And you buy shares there. You invest in it. All of a sudden, you become super interested about smoked ribs are delicious. You check the financial reports of smoked ribs are delicious. If you, if you see an article about smoked ribs are delicious, now all of a sudden you're reading every single word. Where a month ago, you wouldn't have even noticed. Why? Because you've invested there. You've invested there. Suppose you're giving to help a nonprofit organization that's providing care for orphans. When you see an article on the subject, you're hooked. Maybe you're sending money to plant churches in Maputo and Mozambique. And, and then we hear that there's riots happening in Maputo. Now you watch the news and you eagerly pray. Why? Because where you invest you're going to be concerned about. As surely as the compass needle follows north, your heart will follow your treasure. Money leads, the heart follows. <laughs> That's the power that money has. That's the power that we give money in our lives. This is why Paul warns Timothy, so some of you know this passage, Money is the root of all kinds of evil. You guys know it? Sorry? Oh, I'm so glad, guys. Huh? Check, check, check. As a pastor, that's one of the most, like, loving things you can do. It's like when I give you the wrong verse, and you're like, ah, ah, this isn't right. You know, you'd, we're never coming back here again. No, it, it, it doesn't say money is the root of all kinds of evil. The love. 1 Timothy 6.10, for the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. The love for money. M money, it's, guys, you do realize that, that money is just paper. Like, I, I, hope, I hope you realize that. It, it's just a tool. It's a tool that, that, that allows us to do things. It's a tool that we use to, to, to have certain experiences, to go to certain, it's, ju it's just a tool. And, and yet we've wrapped our hearts around it like it's everything. Yeah. That's why Paul says, for the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Uh, uh, do you guys know what the rest of the, the verse is? It's okay, you did very well on the first one. <laughs> and some people craving money have wandered from the true faith. 
That's the power that money has. Like when, when, when we wrap our hearts around, you can wander from the true faith. And then he goes on. And pierced themselves with many sorrows. You are inflicting pain on yourself. With many sorrows. K King Solomon, wealthiest man to have ever lived. He says this. Those who love money will never have enough. How meaningless to think that wealth brings true happiness. How, how upside down is that to the, the, the way that we live today? We go, no, 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 no. If I have more money, then I'll be really happy. And he goes, I've had it all. I've had it all. And still there is this emptiness in me. You can be overflowing with wealth and material possessions. But without an eternal perspective, you will just crave for more and more, hoping to find fulfillment and satisfaction in money, but you will only be left with an insatiable emptiness. That's what happens. I mean, Jesus knew this. He, he knew the, 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 the power that money can have. If, over our lives, if we wrap our hearts around it, I mean, of his 39 parables, right? Jesus told 39 parables. 11 of them were about money. And, and yet, like, we get frustrated when once a year I get up here and I talk about money. Like, when I, when I read that, I went, Jesus, I don't know if I'm being faithful. And you know why? It's the fear of man. It's like, ooh, you know, if I come up here and talk about money, people are going to be like, yeah, let's go find another church. <laughs> smoke machines. And, and again, I'm not against smoke machines. I'm not. Ah, I'm exposing myself, yeah. I really, I really, I really do. No, no, but, but that's the thing. It's like, like there is, and I, and I talk to many pastors, you know, and I go, hey, how often do you talk about money? Nothing. We just kind of hope people will figure it out. Like no one gets up and goes, hey guys, when we give, it's an act of worship. We give our first and best because God has given us his first and best and so we give. And even if we look in the Old Testament and, we, and, and you guys land on like 10%, 10, 10 which is nuts, which is, which is like the fact that God only asks for 10%. Like, I'm going, whoa, wait, but it all belongs to you. It's because he's doing something in our hearts. He's unearthing something in our hearts that, that, that like, we've just wrapped our hearts and everything around money. Our hearts will follow what we treasure. They will follow what we treasure. And if it's the things of this world, li listen to the sad reality. Everything like all the material stuff that we see, will one day rust away. You cannot take it with you. You cannot take it with you. Now, is, is it wrong to have nice stuff and enjoy nice experiences? No. And my hope is that over this, this, this series that you're gonna be able to see that, that like, like the Bible, like, God wants you to have nice stuff and nice experiences. He does. Why would he create this incredible world and then go, you know what, but no. Can't go there, can't go camping. Can't go see the mountains, no, 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 no. Can't have that delicious steak. He, he, wants, he wants you to, to, to enjoy all that he has created. He's a good father. But is it wrong for us to put all our hope in these things? Yes. Yes. If you put your heart in things that will fade away, your heart will also fade away. If you put your heart in things that will fade away, your heart will also fade away. So then, Honor, what's the alternative? Treasure in heaven. Treasure in heaven. Matthew chapter 6, verse 19 to 21. 
Don't store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys, where thieves don't break in and steal. The, the, the Greek more literally says, do not treasure for yourself treasures on earth. The idea is that earthly treasure is temporary and fading away. It's where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But heavenly treasure is secure. Heavenly treasure is secure. Any financial advisor would say to you, make the investment. On that which is secure, make the investment. And Jesus Christ, the greatest financial advisor, says, make the investment. That's what he's saying to us. Make the investment. Think, think about it like this. The, the, the pharaohs of Egypt were buried with gold and treasures to take into the afterlife. And today, you can buy a ticket to go in there and take a look at their stuff that's rusting and fading away. They cannot take it with them. They have to leave it behind. We leave it behind. And gold, gold is a, is, it's a precious thing here on earth. It is, it's a precious thing. And we're told that God uses it to pave the streets of heaven. That, that which we hold on to, that we trade with, that I need to get, God goes, yeah, no, I just, I pave the streets with it. The streets where everybody walks. I mean, I don't, I mean, yeah, okay, maybe here because of the potholes, but I, I don't know when the last time you were like, wow, this road, incredible, it's amazing. I just want to, you just walk. You just drive, you, just, you don't care. And he goes, yeah, that, that, that thing that you've wrapped your heart around, I, I use it to just put down here quickly. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Jesus is making the point that you can only have your treasure and your heart in one place. That's the point that he's making, that you can only have your treasure and your heart in one place. We cannot store up treasure on earth and on heaven at the same time. Jesus goes on to say, you cannot serve both God and money. That's what he says. You, you, can't, you can't, and we try. We're up late at night going, you know, God, if you take 70%, and then maybe if I do 30% here, I think, he's just going, no. God is not a part-time lover. That, that, that's why Jesus says it here. You can't, you can't serve both God and money. And so, friends, we must, we must renew our minds on this. That if we're going to experience the abundant life in our finances, then, then we've got to renew our minds on this. We've got to have that, that kingdom perspective that says, God, everything is yours. And where my treasure is, my heart's going to go. Can I treasure you? I treasure you. And so there they are, the, the two powerful truths that we must anchor our souls in as we navigate through this series and talk about money. God, it's all yours, and you are my treasure. God owns everything, including our money, and we are just his money handlers. And where our treasure is, there our hearts will be also. And so if that is true, and I already know this, I know this, and I know this for myself. Like, I'm, I'm, I'm writing this stuff out, and I'm going, oh, I know where this is going. If those are true, then I know where this is going. And I know that it's true for many of you. If this is true, then that means we need to repent of falling short on these things. We need to repent, to repent, to repent is to turn away from whatever it is that you are pursuing, hoping to find life and meaning in, and that's money. And then to turn to God, who is our treasure. And so, God, we have failed to believe that you own everything. And we are called to be your stewards. In fact, God, we've switched this. We consider ourselves the owners. And, and God is just the money handler. That's why we treat him like an ATM. Like, oh, God, I need my stuff now. Your stuff? We repent of that. We believe you own everything, and we are just the managers. We ask for your forgiveness. Also, we fail to recognize that where our treasure is, our hearts are. And we have treasured earthly things that rust and fade away, 
And do not put our hearts in that which does not fade or rust away. We failed to treasure you and the things of your kingdom. And for that, God, we ask for your forgiveness. Friends, if we are to live the abundant life in our finances and manage money like grown-ups, we first have to be honest with ourselves. When it comes to money, we are either driven by ignorance or neglect, or we're driven by control. And you know what those things are? They're fear. That's what it is. It's fear. And I tell you over and over again, fear is not an emotion. It's a spirit. And we have not been given the spirit of fear. And so I'm going to be praying for you over these next few weeks that, that, that you would be released from the spirit of fear. That, that today, let today be the day where you go, I'm no longer going to live in neglect. And God, I'm not going to live in control. And so I want to give you some homework. I'll call the band up as we wrap up. I want to give you guys some homework. I want you to go home over this next week, and I'd like you to download three months' bank statement. Now, I know some of you are going, I've been doing that for years. Great. You're already further than most of us. Download your three months' bank statement, and then make a cup of coffee or tea and sit at the table. And then I want you to mark out kind of the, the, let's go top five, top six, top seven. It's up to you, right? You be honest. I hope that laugh was like a, yes. And, there we go, amen. And, and here's the thing, here's the thing. I want, I want you to see where your money goes. How you're spending the money. And, but, because it's going to, for some of us, it's super easy. Yes, mortgage, car, like, and you go, and these are the things that I need. Totally fine. So, so do that. Top five, top six, top six, top ten. See it. Write it down. Look at it. And then I want you to go back. And then get the top five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten of the things that you spend money on when you've paid all those other things. Because we, we want to take a, a real look at what you're spending money on. It's those 20,000 coffees that you're getting. Or that cold, refreshing beverage of the fermented nature. <laughs> hey, we just, we just keeping it real. Yeah. Or it's that restaurant that you're always going to. Or take a lot. <laughs> I mean... If we're going to have any success in this, we need to be honest with ourselves. And look, I'm not going to check. I'm not going to come to your house and knock on your door and be like, so did you do your homework? No, it's, it's on you. But the question is, do you want to experience the abundant life in your finances? Surrender everything to Jesus. Even this process, surrender it to Jesus. To go, you know, God, I'm, like, I'm, I'm, I'm worried, I'm concerned, because I know it's going to reveal a lot. Um, I might have to have some conversations with some people, and it's going to reveal a lot. I don't, you know, surrender it to Jesus. Let him be your Lord and Savior. John Wesley says this. He says, get all you can without hunting your soul, your body, or your name. Save all you can, cutting off every needless expense. Give all you can. Be glad to give and ready to distribute. Laying up in store for yourselves a good foundation against the time to come that you may attain eternal life. Here's what he's saying. Make all you can, save all you can, and give all you can. And that's my hope over these next few weeks. That's my prayer. Is that God would accomplish infinitely more than we could ask or think. That God would do far more abundantly than all that we could ask or think. 
that God would do above and beyond all that we could ask or think in your life. And then that would translate to your financial life. And that he would do this according to the power that works in us. To him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. And so here are the three things that we're going to look at over these next few weeks. I want you to be able to save more money than you've ever saved before in your life. I do. And I believe God wants that for you. But also, he wants you to give more money than you've ever given in your life. I can't wait to share that testimony of what God has done in our lives in the last two, three, four years. And then... And this one's going to be epic because I'm just going to be praying for you. Our elders are going to be praying. Folks who have companies and entrepreneurship and are doing business and work in corporate and work in government. Because here's the thing. I also want you to make more money than you've ever made in your entire lives. Sounds weird. Weren't expecting to hear that, were you? But it's going to look different for each and every one of us. But you know what's going to be the same is that we're going to be able to gather together and say we're all living and experiencing abundant life that is found in Jesus. Free in our finances because we are free from them. And so, Father God, I pray for each and every single person here. I pray that in all of this, all that we have spoken about that what we are crying out for is that you would be the center of our lives. I know that we make mistakes. I make mistakes all the time. I fall short all the time. I sin all the time. But your grace is sufficient. There is more grace in you, Jesus, than sin in me. And so when the evil one whispers lies to me about the things that I have done and how I've handled money in the past and how I continue to handle money today, God, I pray that I'd be able to stand firm, anchored in the fact that, God, you own everything, not him. And so I'm praying now, God, that you would release us from being slaves to money and to the things of this world and that we would step into the abundant life that Jesus, you promise us as the good shepherd. And so would you be the center of our lives? Would you use the sermon series for your glory? Would you do a powerful work in and through us? We love you, Lord. In Jesus' beautiful name we pray.